Hi everyone, my name is Jai Fu. I'm a material scientist working at the innovation department of Borough Australia. I am very honoured to be invited by Rylan to talk about the carbonation of concrete, the opportunities for net zero CO2 by 2050 and research needs. Today, my topic is exploring the accelerated carb carbonation potential of Australian recycled concrete aggregates as a long-term CO2 storage solution. As many of us here may have already heard, the cement production is responsible for around 7% of the global um, CO2 emissions. Um, more than half of these emissions are due to release of CO2 upon the thermal decomposition of the main raw material, limestone, during cement uh, production. This chemical composition process, decomposition process, contributes to about 60% of the total carbon emissions of cement manufacturing. At the same time, the fossil fuel used during the manufacturing of cement accounts for the other 40%. For every ton of cement um, manufactured, 700 kilograms to 800 kilograms of CO2 will be released. As long as we don't change the raw material we use to make our um, grey cement, CO2 emissions will be unavoidable. To manufacture cement, um, the raw, the, the powder raw meal is fed into the preheated tower and the calciner. It gets heated and the calcium carbonate in a raw meal undergoes a calcination process. The preheater consists of a serial cyclone through which the raw meal is heated uh, using hot flue gas. Calcination of limestone takes place at around 900 degrees Celsius. The chemical process can be described as CO2, oh, sorry, as cal calcium carbonate transforming into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide gas. A portion of the calcium oxide will react with silicate minerals in the calciner, especially when raw meal particles contain both lime and silicate uh, that are in direct contact, resulting in the formation of belay, as well as some aluminate and ferrite phases. And reacted calcium oxide is denoted as free lime. The calcium raw, raw meal then enters the rotary kiln where the main clinker phase, a light, is sintered at temperature up to 1,450 degrees Celsius. This is why the manufacturing of clinker is so carbon and energy intensive. Greener ways of making and using cement are urgently needed. The industry aims to strive towards its net zero carbon emission target by 2050, even as industrial demand is growing and energy prices are still rising. For the past decades, a lot of effort has been put into developing new binder to substitute Portland cement to create low carbon blended cement systems. Further research has been done um, and continues to investigate and develop new technologies to help mitigate operation or manufacturing carbon emissions. Technology include the new approach to limestone cal calcination, burning waste products um, to power the calciner and pumping CO2 deep underground for permanent storage. Even though we at Boro are working on all levels to minimize carbon emissions as much as possible, a considerable proportion of CO2 emissions generated in cement manufacturing is unavoidable. It cannot be tackled using established techniques such as the use of alternate fuel, clinker substitution. Therefore, we must continue to develop new technologies that prevent CO2 from reaching the atmosphere on a large scale by investing in different carbon capture technologies. One way is to store the CO2 in our, our concrete material via a process called carbonation. Recycled concrete contains alkaline materials in attached mortar are ideal for um, carbonation, then you and they use as ups, upcycled aggregates in concrete, preserving natural resources. This process works by having the cement hydration product gradually reabsorb the CO2 from atmosphere through a physiochemical process called carbonation. Carbonation occurs when CO2 diffuses um, into the pores of cement based materials and reacts with hydrate products. Um, in the presence of pore water. The carbonation starts at the surface of the concrete or mortar and slowly moves towards the core of the material. The carbonation process is also influenced by CO2 concentrations. 
calcium hydroxide and calcium silicate hydrate contents, exposure time, cement type, and water to cement ratio. Carbonation is a natural process, but it just takes very long time to, uh, for it to, to happen. It has been reported that up to 50% of the clinker manufactured uh, manufacturing CO2 emissions can be reabsorbed by the concrete structure during their service life. There is an excessive need for um, aggregates in the production of concrete and other manufacturing um, construction materials due to the massive construction pro um, projects take place worldwide and here in Australia. Therefore, there is a business case for encouraging a recycling facility as well as construction material manufacturers like Borel to source a part of our need for aggregates from recycled materials. According to the 2020 National Waste Report, Australia produced 27 megaton of construction demolition waste, which is about 36% of the total waste produced. 23% of the waste was dis disposed, either as landfill or destroyed. 76% was recycled, 0.7% was recovered for energy at landfill. Usually after demolition, um, of old roads and buildings, the removed concrete is often considered worthless and disposed as demolition waste. By collecting the used concrete and breaking it up, recycled concrete aggregates is created. Recycled material used to produce um, construction aggregates for concrete comes from two primary sources. First source is road construction and maintenance debris. The second stream is structural construction and demolition debris, for example, from demolishing our buildings, um, bridges, and in some cases, airport runways. Most recycled material go through a process of recovery, which includes demolition, breaking, and collecting. Then the material gets transported to a localized collection point, and it gets proce uh, processed. The processing um, stage entails crushing, screening, separating, and stockpiling before it gets marketed as sized products for different uses. Construction and demolition waste may contain impurities such as wood, plastic, metal, glass, paper, which can be removed at the plant. Other material that, that may be present um, can include mortar paste, bitumen, brick tiles, and rubber. Construction demolition waste is crushed, sieved into different size fractions, and recycling plants um, produce um, construction and demolition waste aggregates, which is about 65 to 70% coarse and fine aggregates, and 30 to 35% adhered um, cement paste. That amount of cement paste uh, content um, that coats the aggregate can be reduced as the number of crushes increase, but this will increase production cost. Unfortunately, we can't simply swap out the natural aggregates for recycled concrete aggregates. There are some significant differences and drawbacks regarding recycled concrete aggregates. After crushing, the recycled concrete breaks down to aggregate size. The process can introduce mi micro cracks within the residual mortar and weaken the bond between the original aggregate and the old mortar. Thus, aggregate cement inter interfacial zone consists mainly of loose and porous hydrates. Since the difference in properties of recycled aggregates with respect to natural aggregate is mainly driven by the presence of the old mortar, that adhere to the surface of the recycled aggregates particles. The residual mortar is responsible for the low um, specific gravity, um, high um, absor water absorption, and lower abrasion resistance of recycled aggregates compared to natural aggregates. Residual mortar adhered on to the aggregates is a main factor affecting the property um, such as density, porosity, and water absorption of the recycled aggregates. The density of recycled aggregate is generally lower than natural aggregates, 
due to the heat mortar that is less dense than the um, underlying um, natural aggregates. The variation in density is depends on the specific aggregate in question. That the heat mortar can be lightweight compared to uh, the aggregate of the same volume, um, which cause which result in the decrease in its density. The residual mortar on the recycled aggregates um, has greater porosity, which allows aggregates to hold more water in its pores than natural aggregates. These parameters can be tested using the soundness test to demonstrate to determine um, the resistance of uh, the aggregate uh, to disintegration by repeated rapid cycles of freezing and thawing. The low density, high porosity can lead to a reduction in the durability of the final concrete product. Literature suggests that um, construction and demolition waste aggregates contains about 0.1 to 0.3% higher chlorides and sulfate, sulfates than natural aggregates. While construction and demolition waste aggregates have higher abrasion, they are on average suitable for use in both concrete and, and road purposes. Literature has also just suggested that recycled aggregates have approximately 50% lower crushing values when compared to natural aggregates. But all literature values suggest recycled aggregates are all suitable for non-structural um, non aggregates and the, major and the majority are suitable for minor structural elements. Since the surface of the recycled aggregates is attached to a large amount of aged uh, cement slurry, this will increase the number of pores and cracks resulting in lower workability and lower mechanical property of recycled concrete compared to natural concrete. For example, the higher water absorption of aggregates leads to reduced workability of concrete, thus making concrete difficult to pump. Compressive strength decreases as the content of recycled aggregate increase for both coarse and fine aggregates. Thus, good mix design and preparation of aggregates are needed to maintain high quality concrete. As we have already mentioned, recycled aggregates have lower density and higher porosity, leading to faster chloride and um, carbon dioxide ingress. The higher porosity of both fine and coarse aggregates allows for gas to permeate more easily through the concrete structure. Carbonation depth is increased in recycled aggregates concrete by the same mechanism that increases chloride perme uh, permeability. So due to the time limit uh, we have today, I'm not going to detail for, um, for each of the impact of factors, but as, as, we, as, as you can all see that using recycled um, concrete aggregates uh, to make concrete will have um, a list of impacts that are outlined here. The drawbacks of using recycled aggregates in concrete helps to identify some of the minimal performance specifications that the aggregates and the concrete needs to achieve before it is deemed good enough to be used in non-structural or, mi or minor structural elements. For instance, Transport for New South Wales, Queensland's Department of Transport and Main Road, and Vic Roads or have published technical specifications for concrete that wants to incorporate a portion of recycled aggregates. This specification entails a test one has to perform on the materials all the way down to specifying its applications. Similarly, the requested specifications for employing recycled aggregates are also outlined in different standards, such as the American ASTM and the British BSEN standards. Despite the performance limitation of recycled concrete aggregates, the material has been used in various construction projects worldwide, in countries um, across Asia and Europe. We know it is a viable source of construction material, but with its drawback and limitations on um, that affect its, um, its performance, such as the low density and high water absorption and high porosity, we need to treat the material before it gets used. At Borrow, we are focused to reduce CO2 emissions and capture CO2 from our cement plants. We want to use, utilize a combination of decarbonization te techniques, whether it's calcium looping or combustion technology at existing um, cement plants for carbon capture. 
we want to maximize our on-site CO2 utilization before storage or passed down onto um, um, other industries. For instance, the CO2 rich um, or lean flue gas obtained from this process could be used um, to accelerate the carbonation of recycled concrete aggregates to sequester CO2 and produce secondary aggregates or blocks and pavers. We have been busy in our labs at Borrow and UTS, continue testing our carbonated recycled aggregates. We have and still we have and still running experiments and trials in our laboratories to optimize the ideal conditions for our recycled materials. We have thermal gravimetric analysis and X-ray diffraction to perform initial analytical analysis to see the effectiveness of the carbonation reaction and compare the rate of carbonation. We have conducted concrete trials using our in-house carbonated recycled aggregates at various natural aggregate uh, replacement levels. Our prim preliminary results had shown to be in alignment with the reported results from the literature. We are still doing more experiments to optimize the carbonation parameters further to maximize um, the CO2 uptake of the recycled concrete aggregates. The upcoming objective is to complete the pilot plant construction by the end of the second quarter of 2023 and start bulk carbonation on site using redirected flue gas from the main stack at our Barama cement works. We will transfer the knowledge that we have gathered from our lab trials to optimize the carbonation condition that is most effective and efficient for the pilot scale and eventually scaled up to a commercial scale. To wrap up this presentation, I would like to say how incredibly excited we, we all are at Borrow to be carbonating the locally sourced recycled waste concrete, adding values to what once was an industrial waste product that would go straight into our landfill. We all feel the burden on our shoulders as we get closer and closer to 2030 and 2050. We are working hard to achieve our target emission reduction goals and are all doing what we can to contribute. This project is only the second attempt of its kind in the world. And Borrow is the first to carbonate using redirected flue gas. We are very excited to start permanently locking away some of the CO2 currently being emitted. I want to thank the University of Technology Sydney for providing technical support and the support from the federal government to fund Borrow and UTA through the Carbon Capture Use and Storage Development Fund to demonstrate the viability of this process by building a pilot plant at Barama Works and utilize the products to perform concrete trials. Thank you. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. If you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to me.